inviting me to speak to the conference. I'm just sad that I can't be with everyone in uh, Egypt. I have enjoyed my previous visits there. And also earlier this year, I spoke to colleagues um, in Cairo about OCD and enjoyed that interaction. So I was delighted to be asked back to talk to you about um, one of the obsessive compulsive disorders called body dysmorphic disorder, which is very dear to my heart and um, something I'm keen to share information with you about. So without much ado, I just want to start by reminding ourselves something about the condition of body dysmorphic disorder. I always recount the fact that when I first learned something about this condition was when I sat my MRC psych a good number of years ago and had to write an essay about this condition for which I knew very little, which was probably the state of things at that time. Well, things have improved a little bit, but the important thing to note is body dysmorphic disorder is a highly morbid and common difficulty. And so it's important that we are fully aware of it as well as its impact. And so the thing that has happened most recently in the history of body dysmorphic disorder is it has been moved in our diagnostic um, nosology and it now sits in both DSM-5 and ICD-11 under the categories of obsessive compulsive and related disorders. So just remind ourselves in that category, we have OCD itself, hoarding disorder, trichotillomania, skin picking disorder, but these headline difficulties of OCD and body dysmorphic disorder now belong and are considered to be part of the spectrum of obsessive compulsive disorders. That's important because it reflects the state of our understanding and the state of the research, but also helps us think about how we design treatments. The other thing I'd say just before I move on is, if you were like me, where you'd actually had very little teaching and training on body dysmorphic disorder during your career, you were almost or are almost certainly missing it. This is a common disorder that represents two to perhaps 3% of the general population. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist and I work in the National Specialist Service for OCD and BDD at the Maudsley Hospital in London. And we know that approximately two to 3% of the general population has um, BDD. But in, in, in teenage life, and particularly for females in late teenage life, this can represent as much as 5 to 6% of teenagers. And I hope as I go on to talk to you about some of the risks associated with BDD, that will really stick in your mind. And if you take one thing away from my talk, perhaps, it is just to think about screening for body dysmorphic disorder. So... How do we do that? Body dysmorphic disorder is common, and what service users will tell you who have BDD is they feel so ashamed and so utterly convinced that their appearance is abnormal, abhorrent, or disgusting, that they see too much shame in sharing that information. And also, and importantly, they very often due to delusional levels of belief about their appearance, don't think that there's anything that someone from a mental health background can do or offer to help. So they often think instead that the difficulty is one that can only be solved by cosmetic surgeries or other types of treatment, certainly not something that's due to their mental health. So. If you're going to commit to asking about it, well, how do you do that? Another story, just before I, I tell you this. So for the first 10 years that I was a senior consultant, I was responsible for looking after our emergency assessment. So people being seen who presented in accident and emergency, very often after self-harm or suicide attempts. And I did that for 10 years. And I sadly have to say that I don't ever 
remember having a conversation about BDD. It's before I knew more about it. And why is that? Well, I've talked about the sense of shame. And often the patients walk through the doors having taken an overdose or people ask questions that are relevant to their depressed mood. But don't ask these core questions that sit behind those levels of distress. So I've taken these screening questions from Kathy Phillips' wonderful book called The Broken Mirror, which simply ask, are you very worried about your appearance in any way? And if yes, just tell me about the concern. Does it preoccupy you? And that leads into questions about how much time it takes up and how preoccupying it is. And it's important for diagnostic uh, reasons that you find some evidence of compulsive behaviours, repetitive actions that the person engages in in order to decrease their level of distress. And of course, like every diagnostic question, we want to know that this isn't just everyday unhappiness about appearance. You need to know that there is distress and that it is causing significant impact on social life, relationship life, schooling and work. Kathy Phillips in her book says that if you ask these questions and ask them in the right way, you'll easily pick up at least 80% of people who have BDD to carry out a more thorough and comprehensive assessment. I want to emphasize before we move on that this is not a difficult diagnosis to make, but it's a very easy diagnosis to miss. If you don't ask those initial questions, people who have tremendous worries about appearance causing suicidality, well, I can almost guarantee you they will not tell you about it unless you ask. The important thing, just, I'm not going to go through lots and lots of detail about more detailed assessments, but one of the important qualifiers to make a diagnosis is that you must ask a patient whether they um, are worried about their weight and have the view that if they were to lose weight, losing weight alone would sort out all of their appearance concerns. If the answer to that is yes, it's all just about my weight and losing weight, you are probably having to screen more and think about an eating disorder. But your typical BDD patient has these distressing appearance-related anxieties, preoccupying compulsive activities to resolve the anxiety, and they're not worried about their weight. People sometimes ask me what tools you can use to help do more detailed assessments. If you're taking this forward, I can commend any of these um, measures on the screen here to you. The most commonly and widely used of them is the BDD modification of the Yale Brown Obsessive Compulsive Scale, or the BDD Y box, as we um, uh, call it. It's so worth having a look at that one. It helps you run through a body scan to work out where the appearance concerns lie. And then it asks you to look for the range of compulsive behaviours. It then helps you rate the severity. So that is the gold standard tool, but there are others there, and I'm not going to go through each of them in detail due to time. Now, much like other types of obsessive compulsive disorder, people with BDD don't just have one worry. The person with BDD very typically worries about multiple parts of their appearance. This is research and a graph from um, uh, research carried out by my dear colleague David Matash Coles, who was in our team and now heads up the service in Sweden at the Karolinska Institute. But what it shows is the areas of the body that children and young people in this sample were worried about. The important point to note and perhaps take away from this is that a typical BDD patient will worry about multiple parts of their body. And that's why a tool like the BDD Y box is so helpful and instructive because if you've mapped out the full range of worries and concerns, you have a chance to then tackle those carefully 
with therapeutic intervention. So I told you that the worries always in BDD lead to compulsive, repetitive behaviors. And these can take many forms, camouflaging with makeup, spending hours, for instance, applying and reapplying makeup in men or women, uh, redoing hair over and over, mirror checking for many hours, often avoidant, compulsive avoidant behavior, avoiding reflective surfaces so you don't catch sight of your image, grooming, plucking, preening, tweezing. I've seen it all. People then often engage in quite active um, reassurance seeking. I assessed a young boy recently who spent several hours a day redoing his hair over and over again and getting his parents to reassure him that included video recording his appearance so that he could check it to meet his satisfaction. And just like other forms of OCD, that sense of satisfaction often comes with a so-called just right quality. I'm now satisfied that it is just right. This is a condition that appears to be more common in females than males, perhaps three times as many females as there are males with BDD, but that's perhaps not true in the more severe forms of the condition, but it is certainly not the case that this is a disorder just of females. I don't have time to go into the epidemiology in detail, but the prevalence alters with age, as does the mix between males and females. But whenever you look, this is a common disorder causing high levels of distress, which is typically unrecognized. Let me talk about differential diagnosis. I've, off, I've talked already about how this condition can often be missed. It can masquerade um, as OCD as social phobia, because these patients often don't go out, as eating disorder, because they may alter their diet in some way, and very typically um, patients um, can present with depressed um, uh, affect. So body dysmorphic disorder can present alongside any of these other conditions. So if you have BDD, it is very common almost the norm to be depressed in mood. So that is one of the commonest um, comorbidities. Also, it is extremely common to develop social phobia, avoiding social contact due to um, concerns and often paranoid levels of uh, ideation about uh, appearance. So that overlap and the differential diagnosis is an important one to tease apart. So psychosis can happen in BDD. Of course, I'm not going to say that um, it, it can't. But BDD, for a long time, people wondered whether it was a type of psychosis. And the reason I say that is up to one half of patients with BDD will have what I call delusional intensity beliefs about their appearance. So I assessed somebody recently who thought that their nose occupied 80% of the front of their face. Another person who thought that their skin was battleship grey, completely unlike the colour of anyone else's. And these beliefs are unfixable and delusional in intensity, much like we can meet patients with anorexia how, who have delusional intensity beliefs about their appearance. And it's important to remember that a delusional intensity belief does not mean that somebody is psychotic. So very often, clinicians will phone me up and ask for some advice about how they might treat somebody with um, body dysmorphic disorder, and they'll say, I think I'm going to start them on an antipsychotic because their belief is so fixed and of delusional intensity. And we know from good quality research that using antipsychotic medication does not help BDD patients. It, the, I will talk more later about the kinds of medications that can be helpful, but we'll come back to that. 
So it's just important to take away from this slide, comorbidity is the norm in BDD. The differential diagnosis can take some teasing apart to see what is the most dominant feature. And that psychosis doesn't, um, is not the best description of the presentation of someone with delusional intensity BDD. It is an obsessive compulsive disorder with a delusional intensity belief in 50% of instances. Now I talked about um, suicidal ideation and suicidal attempts in my, the earlier part of my presentation. Very sadly, for patients both child and adolescent and adult with BDD, suicidal ideation is the norm. And virtually every study of adults with BDD has shown that up to half of them will make an attempt on their life. So this is a disorder that is presenting in your emergency rooms. And you are thinking it's driven by depression or other things and missing the fact that BDD can sit behind that. Indeed, if you follow up people with BDD, the social phobia into adulthood very typically leads to substance misuse. Um, alcohol and um, other substances are very common and up to a third of patients with BDD will misuse substances. And in the group of patients who have substance misuse and BDD, a recent follow-up study has shown that 100% of the participants who took part had made an attempt on their life. Uh, in our own hands, looking at children and young people in our own uh, research trials, we found that even on screening young people and finding young people with BDD, that already 43%, so nearly a half of them, were self-harming. Substance use is extremely common, and if you follow these people up into adulthood, people seeking um, cosmetic surgeries and repeated cosmetic surgeries, and all the risk associated with that is very common. We've seen many examples of people having huge amounts of debt because of BDD, cosmetic surgeries, endless amounts of uh, money spent on uh, makeup and other cosmetic um, treatments, clothes, um, things to, to cover up appearance and guy's appearance. Something I should have mentioned, and I, I apologize for forgetting to mention this, wherever this has been studied, BDD has been found to be equally common across culture and ethnicity. So this is not an issue of um, a Western world, and there's lots of um, consideration as to what the impact of social media and magazine media are on BDD. But if we think about every language and culture that exists, there are many, many words that describe appearance and ugliness, and its salience in every culture is perhaps what sits behind the fact that BDD exists within every culture. If we think about the impacts, it is very common for people to avoid going out, failed working lives, failed social lives, and in the context of schooling, up to a third of the young people that I see with BDD have stopped attending school, are limiting their social and other relationships and are engaging with um, suicide attempts. So the impact is enormous. I mentioned already, and this is just a quick note, to say that we know that appearance concerns in the general population are very common. And we've tried to carry out in school age populations to understand and better estimate just where and how common are appearance concerns in general society as opposed to um, a, a level of concern uh, that is like BDD. And this is a study that we carried out looking at concern across um, uh, teenage uh, young people, boys and girls, and it showed actually that 60 to 80 percent of young people have a worry about their bodily appearance but we went on to screen in this general school-based population and found 
that the highest prevalence was in the teenagers between 17 and in fact up to 23, we think that up to 5% of females meet that higher level of concern with really disordering beliefs and compulsive behaviours. I want to move on before we finish to talk about treatment. There are two internationally recognised types of treatment that are efficacious and can be advocated. And I'm excited personally that my own team, amongst others, have really driven forward recently the psychological therapies for body dysmorphic disorder. And we're excited to report that the outcomes in those trials are now approaching the sorts of very good outcomes for psychological therapy that you can expect in conditions like OCD. But let me tell you a little bit more about that. I'll talk about medication first. The bedrock of medication treatment is with SSRI medication. And I've put up a trial here from a treatment trial um, looking at the use of high-dose fluoxetine against placebo in patients with BDD. So if I just grab the pointer here, if I can. The thing I want you to note is that you have to be patient. I don't have time to go into all of the detail, but you typically have to take up the treatment to high dose as of medication. So this is on a treatment trial of fluoxetine, 60 milligrams, and you have to be patient. The reason I'm highlighting this point where the asterisk is, is that it was after eight weeks of treatment that the control and the placebo group started to pull away from each other. So you need to introduce and increase the medication up to a high dose. The response is slow, but expert consensus shows that over a long period of time, you can see significant improvements in the obsessionality and compulsive behaviors, as well as proven reductions in the rates of suicidal thoughts and low mood. So high dose SSRI medications. Just a brief word about um, uh, antipsychotic use again before we finish by talking about CBT. So there have been studies looking at the delusional intensity group. You'll recall that half of the patients with BDD will have a delusional intensity set of beliefs about appearance. And antipsychotic medications don't help them. But research, fortunately, has shown that that delusional intensity group are just as likely to respond to SSRI medications, and they are also very likely to respond to psychological therapy. So the bedrock treatment is not to add in antipsychotic, but to optimize and maximize the, the, the dosage of uh, fluoxetine. So I'm a child and adolescent practitioner, and I would typically use uh, aim to go to a dose of fluoxetine 60 milligrams a day for someone aged over 13 or sertraline 200 milligrams uh, uh, for someone aged over the age of 13. And I increase up to that dose over the course of about one month. I'm going to move on to what is perhaps the bedrock of treatment and the area that is showing the greatest promise for helping people with this dreadful condition. We were the first team in the world to develop and deliver a randomized control trial of cognitive behavioral therapy for adolescents with BDD in our clinic back in 2015, and we've been following that up ever since. I don't have time to go into the details of the therapy, but we modified it from adult treatment uh, manuals and offered it as a randomized control trial. And what we can see here is that in the earliest parts of the treatment, we saw improvement. So we offered 14 weeks of therapy, and actually by the 14th um, treatment session, we were seeing that the treatment group has improved, their scores have gone down and have pulled away from the control group 
who were having um, uh, uh, support and anxiety management. But furthermore, our initial paper, we showed that at two months, those gains were maintained and that the two, the control and the placebo group, were um, still uh, apart from each other. We followed those kids up for 12 months and we showed that the treatment gains were maintained right into follow-up. So beyond the two-month follow-up, we were seeing good treatment responses continuing. Now, there were still many people who were still quite poorly and needed further support and treatment, but we've done a lot of improvement in our treatment protocol. We initially offered a, um, 14 sessions of CBT. We've now extended that treatment to offer 20 sessions of CBT, and we're showing that we can get um, treatment responses um, of people into remission, I beg your pardon, treatment remission rates for BDD in the order of 80%. That approaches those seen in OCD and the best that you can find within mental health. My time is running out, so I'm just going to finish to, to talk again about the risks of cosmetic surgery. I work within the Morsi Health Services in the Middle East, and I know that cosmetic um, uh, treatments are very common uh, in, in parts of the Middle East. And this is just a letter to highlight some of the work that we have to underdo with, undertake with our cosmetic surgery colleagues. So this relates um, to a patient who was referred, uh, and we share this anonymized letter, where we'd actually shared that the young person consulting for a rhinoplasty actually had a diagnosis of BDD. And you, you can see in this anonymized letter that the surgeon acknowledged that, but nonetheless, in their mind, felt that they would be helped by um, surgical treatment. And very typically what happens, and indeed happened in this case, this young woman had surgery and was unhappy with the treatment outcomes and um, decided, as is very typical, to seek many more surgical revisions. So the risks are not unsurmountable, and I just want to emphasize that. BDD is a condition that's receiving a lot of interest, and this is a um, reference point to the BDD Foundation, an excellent UK-based um, or a charity that you could have a look online. They offer a lot of information. We do a lot of active work with them, and I would commend them to you. There are US and other organizations, but that would be a great starting point. I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer any questions should they arise. Thank you.